Hi. Uh, welcome back to the Atlantic's Exploration of the Future of Democracy. I'm Alice McCown, the publisher and chief revenue officer of The Atlantic. This morning, The Atlantic's journalists, alongside elected officials and national leaders, contextualized the fragility of democracy, both domestically and globally. This afternoon, we continue the examination of democracy with a conversation focused on the future of American conservatism and the evolution of the nation's political parties. Please welcome Governor Chris Sununu of New Hampshire. Returning to lead the conversation is Evan Smith, a contributing writer with The Atlantic and a senior advisor to Emerson Collective. Thank you, Alice. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you as well to this conversation with the Honorable Chris Sununu, the 82nd governor of New Hampshire about the future of American conservatism. Last November, Governor Sununu was elected to his fourth term leading the Granite State, winning nearly 57% of the vote. This is for the governor, the family business. His brother represented New Hampshire in both the US House and the US Senate. His father was a three-term New Hampshire governor before serving as White House Chief of Staff under President George H.W. Bush. Most important, his mother was on the school board. Now you right. got it. There you go. Now you got it. A native of Salem, New Hampshire, the governor is a graduate of MIT with a degree in civil and environmental engineering. Governor, welcome. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you. Good to be here. Good to have you. I, I'm not going to correct you right off the bat, but so look, we'll start right in with New Hampshire politics because people say, oh, you're from this giant political family. And I said, well, I'm from a giant family. There were 10 of us, right? I'm number but seven. You're one of, eight, of eight siblings. One of eight kids. Yeah, one of eight so kids. So the fact that, yeah, my mom was school board, my dad, brother, and I have all run for office, that is like par for the course for New Hampshire. That's actually probably a little under, that's only 40% of the family. In New right. Hampshire, everybody runs for everything at some point because the government, so it's very fundamentally different than anywhere else. I love that. Yeah. Um, Governor, I'm gonna go right to 2024, because why not? Hey, anything to skip over 2020, happy right, to do yeah, it. Well, no, no, we're gonna, <laughs> believe me, we're gonna, we're gonna go back to the future on that here in a little bit. So, so we know you're considering running for president as a Republican getting into the primary. We know it because literally we read it and hear it every single day. So just cut the shit, tell us right now, are you running? Ah. Uh... No, I don't know. I really don't know. So look, my, my goal is, and, and maybe for the last year or so, the media asked me to go on. I go on. I go on a lot of, I do a lot of media. But I don't ask to go on. They did, I just, I don't know, maybe I say provocative things or something. I was a four-term governor. I've managed a pandemic. I've kind of been through hell and back. Right. These are the ABCs of me. I just, I don't couch my words. I don't try to be coy. Uh, I try not to be too rude. And I try to be super positive because I think that's part of the job too. But at the end of the day, when I, when I look at 24, when I look at what just happened in November of 22, a couple of things stand out, right? Extremism doesn't win, definitely not on the Republican side. Republicans, I think, have a great product. I feel, feel very strongly in the conservative product of limited government and local control and all of these things. But we are the worst messengers. We are terrible messengers. Republicans are still advertising to people, I'm so-and-so and this is my policy and vote for me, like it's 1985. Democrats are brilliant about creating influence over years, months, and they create influence with media and, and all the and entertainment, academia, uh, all the different ways people consume information. Democrats are just much better. I think they have a vastly inferior product, if you will, but they're really, really good at selling it. And so it's like, why, why were we stuck with VHS when Betamax was the better product back in 1980, right? So sometimes the, you need to, you can have the best product in the world, but if you're not out there, I'm just trying to get out there and, and kind of reinvigorate independence, get the disenfranchised young people that said, yeah, I would have been a Republican, but I'm not, I don't want to be part of that team. It's not our team. I think just the messaging that's leading a lot of the headlines uh, doesn't truly represent us. I'm trying to show kind of the, the better side, if you will, the funner side. I think the side that most Republicans are actually in, even though a lot of us don't, uh, that, that are kind of where I am, don't, don't get the headlines. But it is a great product for young people. Individual liberty, you come first. The whole concept that we're not gonna have a government telling us what to do, big government solutions, that is not what Republicans are about, right? And that should be empowering to everyone as an individual. The fact that you're the voter, guess what? I'm the governor, you're smarter than I am. You know what your schools need, you know what your business needs, you know what your, not me, you know. So I'm gonna give you the, the money, the power, the authority to make all those decisions at a local level, not a big government level, 
And it, raise, it creates efficiency, it raises the system up, it gets more people involved, it empowers you as an individual. That is great conservatism in my book, but that message isn't really out there. We all wanna talk about wokeism and cancel culture as if that's gonna you know, be a government-driven solution, which it's not. So I'm just trying to uh, you know, be a better seller of what I think is a pretty cool product. You, you sound like you're running for, uh, as, a, as a Democrat in Texas rather than as a Republican in New Hampshire. <laughs> No, I'm just the best damn Republican you ever saw. You're just not used to seeing it. Is that it? it? Yeah, that's it. Um, uh, G Governor, you, you lay out, we're going to unpack all of that in the, in the next yeah, hour. Sure. You lay out a case that makes me think you're farther along and that you actually know whether you're going to run no. or not. No, 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 no. I so really what don't. are the considerations that get you from here to either yes or no? Yeah, so I'll probably make a decision, uh, a real firm, clear yes or no, July, August, right? Because I, if I decide to run, I tell you what, I would love to be in a debate. I love debates. I love getting on the stage. You want ratings, I'll get your ratings um, at a minimum. And, and we'll, we'll talk about real issues, but we'll also talk about character and all that thing. I'm not afraid to talk about anything. Uh, it's a family discussion as well, right? Yep. And kind of this exploration, this travel. Yesterday morning, I woke up in Georgia. I had been speaking at AEI. I went to the Gridiron Dinner last night in Washington, DC. I was up quite late, uh, kind of schmoozing, if you will, with some folks. Did, literally didn't sleep a week. Wink got on a plane at 3.30 uh, this morning, flew to Houston, and then here. And the right. schedule's brutal, is my point. The schedule can be brutal. There is nothing I like more than interviewing a governor who likes to talk, who pulled an all-nighter, because there we're probably going to make some news yeah, today. Probably. Right? But yeah, right. so, no, but that's, that's a part of the decision. It's a hard schedule. I have kids and family. Um, I, we don't want an overly crowded field. And we will have a crowded field for those Republicans out there that are nervous about that. But don't worry. We will winnow it down very quickly. This is not going to be 2016. Right. I'm going to make, as the referee of the first in the nation primary state, whether I'm in the race or not, I'm going to pull the levers and we're going to right. effectively drive people out that have no right being there. So, so this, this was described by Puck News this week as the Sununu tease. You're serious about this. This oh, is yeah, not sure. just teasing us. So we, yeah, we, well, yeah. You're, 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 you are absolutely thinking about this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. And, and part of what we talked about before we came up here is you oh, I don't, are We'll not, see how this interview goes. Maybe by the end of the interview, I'll be like, oh, my God, this is a nightmare. Get me off the stage. Or but maybe no, you'll be, be in okay. the race in the next hour. We'll yeah, actually see. Um, unlike some other people who are looking at this race, you don't have to run because you're term limited. So, like, there was, yeah. a, for instance, a, 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 the thought that if Governor Yunkin of Virginia gets in, one reason may be he's got to stop uh, being governor after one term. Yeah. You are not term limited. You could theoretically, so it's kind of a free shot for you, basically. Yeah, so right. New Hampshire is one of the only states I have to get elected every two years as governor, uh, which is, uh, it's very hard. I, unlike a congressman who has like, what, 26 weeks of vacation or whatever they get, and even when they're working, are they really working, let's face it. Right. Please. So, but a governor and all of us, Republican, Democrat, we're 24 7, right? There's a flood, there's a shooting, there's an emergency, there's an issue with the, whatever it is, our phone is constantly on. Now, to add in, I have to get a, run, run an election every two years is incredibly challenging for me. It's hard, it wears on you. It's a great system for the state, right? And this whole idea that I've heard, of, I don't know, I've heard a couple people lately say, I, I can't get enough done in four years. Are you kidding me? You, the, two years is more than enough time to get stuff done, and I'm proof positive. I get stuff done, and if I don't, you should fire me. And that's the New Hampshire way. So that's complete accountability. Account of, the, complete the accountability in the system, right? Do your job, or we're going to kick your butt out, and we got someone else to step in. And so it's, a, it's great for, for, for the state, and that's why when they wanted me to run for the U.S. Senate, and I strongly considered it, but they were effectively also asking me to quit, not just what I love doing, and I love being governor. It's, it's, as we say in New Hampshire, it's wicked hard, right? It's a wicked hard job, but it's also amazingly fulfilling, right? When you rebuild a mental health system, when you figure out where the barriers with treatment and recovery in this fentanyl crisis that is just out of control, and you have to rebuild, a whole, I'm an engineer, so I love rebuilding and redesigning system. When you go through the Thousand pages of how Medicaid really works, and I will not bore you with that. But I got to learn it. I got to figure it out because when it's not working for somebody, I'm the guy that has to redesign it. Congress is, doesn't redesign anything. Senators don't know how mental health systems actually work or the points of access for your family members in a moment of crisis. They have no idea, right? Think about what, the difference between Washington and governors. And here's where I'll, I'm not trying to just pick on them, but Washington is about approving a policy, approving funding, and then they're, they're, they're kind of done. The whole system design, implementation, making sure the roads are plowed, the things are bought, managing inflation and workforce issues with nonprofits, government employees, schools running, making sure kids have what they, that all happens at the state and governor's level. And that's what I love. 
So we do, we're doing the hard work, but when you do it right, man, it can become incredibly fulfilling. So yeah, they were asking me to quit what I love doing, yeah. quit what can get the best results for my state, and go become 99 of 100 people that maybe once every three months will pass a bill and pat themselves on a the back. And you know, I, 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 we, I won't bore you with the stories, the, the reasons I was told why I should run for, this, for the Senate from the other US senators, but it was, it, it was frustrating. Well, it was, but it was, it was clear from that whole period of time where you were considering this, that yes, being in New Hampshire was more appealing to you, but that also being in Washington was absolutely less appealing. Well, is it appealing right? to anybody? I mean, think, I, it sounds so like a good run, idea. But then why run for president? You know you have to be in Washington. Because that's an executive. That's the CEO that right. can fix things. Yeah. Leadership, look, can I can tell my legislature what to do? No. I've had Republican legislatures in New Hampshire. I've had Democrat legislatures. Do you know, I have the largest legislature in the free world. 400 members. 400. That represent, like the whole state. Yeah. It, right? <laughs> and you know what the split is right now? 201 to 199, Republican versus Democrat. I got my speaker on the first ballot, by the way. And I tell, McCar I tell Kevin that all the time. But that's literally it. So whether we're a split government or I have uh, Dems, or re I always get stuff done. And so uh, as an executive, and it's not because I'm Republican or Democrat, it's because I'm an executive. And I understand the concepts of giving a little uh, and getting a lot. I know how to work with folks. I'm not, I don't want to use, I use the word manipulate the system, but I know how to take a piece of legislation, okay, how do we get this one over the line? And then how do we implement and all that? A, an executive can do that. My biggest frustration with the former president, and I support him in 16, I support him in 2020, but he said we were gonna do immigration reform. And they tried him, this immigration reform bill and it, it got no, it really went nowhere. And I said, look, there's 10 or 15 things we have to do on immigration reform. You can't get all 10, fine, go after the first three. Because you can get Republicans and Democrats to agree on a couple basics, right? And then, you, and then you get success there, and you go after a couple more, and a couple more. But we did nothing. It's my biggest frustration with Republicans. We had the House and the Senate and the presidency in 1718, and we did not have the leadership to keep going after the things that were really critical. Healthcare reform. I was told we are going to get it. We didn't. Fiscal discipline. Forget about it, right? I mean, I thought we were going to get it. Out the door. So I'm not saying the former president was a disaster on everything. I, don't, I think he was great on regulatory reform, never got enough credit for it. He was phenomenal with getting the vaccine out, very important, doesn't get enough credit for it. So he did some really good things, but some of the key things in government that I was expecting to get done, a CEO can do it, right? But you have to know how to do it in both the public and the private sphere. Nah, a little lacking there. This is the most positive you've been about the former president that I can remember on a stage in oh, no, a I've while. Been, no, really? Well, you talk about the former president is too extreme. You talk about, I mean, what did you yeah, say about Yeah, but everybody does. Right, well, but what did you say about him at the gridiron last year? I know, that, like, you know, People speak at the gridiron, they make jokes. What, well, how did, it, okay, the gridiron is a comedy him? roast. Okay, but what did you say last year? Well, okay. One of us, you can say it or I can say it. You no, pick. No. So this is my frustration. <laughs> yeah. I said, and I won't, I'm, well, I was going to say the word. I don't want to, I, I had to pause myself. I said he was effing crazy, right? But it was, look, it was in the delivery of the joke. It was wonderfully delivered. Well, what you said may, was, right? he's I not, mean, it you, was, said, you said he's not crazy enough to be institutionalized, but if he's in, he's not getting out. Yeah. That's what you said. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. Again, your delivery stinks, Evan. Like, you got to, you got I can sell it way better. Wait, let me, let okay. me let's start from you the beginning. Well, I'll do the whole, do I'll yeah, do the whole act. We'll but, get a brick wall out here so you can actually I'm stand I'm not going to lie. That was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, as a, look, politicians are not funny. We all think we're funny. Because right. when, when a politician makes a dumb joke in the state house, everybody laughs because everybody wants something. And governors think they're actually funny, but they're not. We're amazingly unfunny. So when you get a bunch of politicians, and last night was the one-year anniversary, they did it again. Pence spoke this year instead of me. Um, and, and Mike's a great guy. Um, again, not quite great on the delivery of, of some of his lines, but it really is like a four-hour comedy hour, if you will, with the press and politicians, and the, we pick on Republicans, we pick on Democrats. Right before I gave the Trump joke, I made jokes about my dad, right? Right. It, so, it, you know, it's, it's self-deprecating humor. It, it's, it, it humanizes you. It got a lot of press because I used the F word, but it was a good joke. So is, is the former president crazy? No, he's not crazy. No, that, no. Look, um, there's a lot of narcissism there. Uh, he says some incredibly irrational things. He says a lot of things that I'm that I know he doesn't even believe. Right. So he just has a lot of attributes of of poor leadership 
that yeah. have, and, and I say, thank you for your service. You did your four years. You got a few things done that I like, not enough that I would have liked to have seen. It's not in us to go backwards. It is not in, people say all the time, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? It's going to be, it's not, he's not getting the nomination. And, and the proof is in who we are as Americans. Do Americans ever settle? Do we ever settle for the latest technology? No, we want the next best thing. We want the next big idea. We want the next 2.0. We want the next iPhone. Whatever the next thing is, that in its essence is what makes this country so great, right? We're always, in, we're always inspired to be innovative. Yeah, there we go. I got one out of 400 shops. No, but really, we, what keeps us going, what keeps us motivated, what makes us the envy of this world, because it is far and away the greatest nation of the world, is that anyone can take a good idea and create the next best thing, and you know the rest of America is dying for it. And you can fight for it and advertise and get there. So, to say that the best opportunity for tomorrow's leadership is yesterday's leadership, that ain't in the American DNA. It is not in our spirit, and it's just not going to happen. So, Don't worry about it. So, so t I want to stay with that idea for a second. So I saw an Emerson College poll within the last couple of weeks that said, in your own state. Yeah, that was a bad poll. Don Donald Trump was overwhelmingly the favorite yeah. for the Republican nomination. You were at 7% in third place in your well, own I'm not state. running. He's running. I'm not running. I'm shocked I'm even in a poll, so that's not an issue. Right. But no, so no, uh, so two things. That poll that you're referencing, I do know that poll very well. It's, a, it's, a, it's horrible. All, right now, I honestly believe if the election were today, DeSantis wins in New Hampshire, like hands down. You think so? Oh, I know so. With, with that. So I'm not sure that poll was really, that was, was massively skewed in a lot of ways. The fact that it had me even at 7% tells you there was something wrong with the poll because I'm not even running. But no, no, right now in my state, I can tell you DeSantis would win. I think if, if it were Iowa today, it'd be between Trump and Pence. It was Florida. DeSantis would crush Trump today. Uh, South Carolina, Trump probably wins. Even if you have two South Carolinians in the race? Yeah, and I, look, I love Nikki and I love Tim Scott. I think they're both awesome people. I mean, really awesome people. Yeah. But they, they've been running for two years and they're not kind of getting anywhere. Nikki would, will challenge, I think, Trump. DeSantis is probably in third in that one. Uh, Tim just doesn't seem to have the fire, the connection. Right. I'm not sure what's there, but all right. So let's guy, let's go back to this question. You said I know he's not going to be the nominee. You don't want to say he's crazy, but you have said out loud, and you seem to. You believe, say he's crazy. You think he's crazy? I'm a journalist. I have no opinions. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay, okay. So I have to have an opinion, but you can't. <laughs> I, have, I have no. Well, I'm not running. So there you go. Didn't you retire? What I. You, I read you retired. I don't think I think you can say whatever you want. It, it was all a lie. Um, <laughs> but you have said out loud, though, that he is too extreme. Oh, of course. You absolutely believe that. So the framing of this race as a normal lane versus an extreme lane and you're in the normal lane, you lane, pardon me, you basically buy that framing. Yes, absolutely. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. Well, look, extremism can't win. That's what we, we saw a lot of extreme candidates that tied themselves to kind of big extreme messaging in, in November of 22. They, we, should have had, we could have had 54 seats in the Senate. Most of those candidates lost. You had really extreme candidates, Mastriano running for governor in Pennsylvania. Uh, that bat shit crazy. Let's just throw it where it is. That guy was nuts. Um, you know, and, and I don't think he's going away. So this he's I, talking about running against uh, I, uh, Bob Casey, isn't he? There, oh, have fun with that one. I mean, just crazy. But even so, the guy who ran against Maggie Hassan after you declined to run, Don Boldick, you didn't actually think he was a particularly good candidate. Did he you? called me a Chinese communist sympathizer that had funded terrorism. I, I, I'm going to okay. take that as a no. No, right? no. But so here's where it is. So, well, here, you want a good story? I'll be. Oh, I'll be go, go, go. I, I, I don't mean to bore you with my ten tangential story. So oh, no, this is good. I very much supported the other candidate in that race. I even tried to get Trump. I was on the phone with Trump uh, in September and trying to get him to endorse this guy Chuck Morris, who I was behind, a more moderate, reasonable, experienced candidate. And Trump was going to do it. He said, I'm, "All right, I'm in." Um, he talked to Chuck. Chuck was sitting right next to me. He called Chuck. Chuck turns to me. He says, "He's going to endorse." I said, "This is great. We're going to bring it back. We're going to win this thing. We can win in November." He said, "The president just wants to call you one more time." I said, "Great." Never called. He chickened out. Chuck, so he didn't endorse Chuck. Chuck fell. He lost by a percent or two or whatever it was. And we got this really extreme candidate. Now, I'm the governor. I'm the head of the party. Um, and even though Don had said some, the, his name is General Boldick, had said some really nasty things about me, uh, I was trying to unify the party. And so we do this thing called um, the Unity Breakfast on the day after the primary. And he, all the winners get up and, and make little speeches, and we're all unifying, and the party's there. We're going to, you know, we have a very late primary. It's in September, so we need to unify fast to get over the line in November. 
and he gets up and does this speech, and everyone cheers, and he gets off the stage, and, he come, and I'm on the side. I'm, like, standing on the side, and he comes over with a hug. I'm like, oh, boy, this is real. Well, this is happening. So he came over, and I gave him the big hug, and we showed unity. I went on Hannity, and my argument was, look, anything is better than a left-wing uh, Senator that, uh, Hassan that just doesn't even show up for the job because she wasn't. So my argument was I'll take anybody that is actually willing to show up even though I might disagree with the general on a few issues. Now he fell far short because extremism lost that year. But at the end of the day, my job is to unify the party. Uh, I've said I will support, the, I'm, gonna, I'm a lifelong Republican. I am going to support the Republican nominee coming out, but it ain't going to be Trump. Well, I want to wanna talk about that because in the yeah. normal lane of potential candidates has been you, uh, Larry Hogan, Mitt Romney potentially, Liz Cheney. Now, Romney's yeah, I, not but running. I got to be clear. I am not. Don't put me in the Larry Hogan, Mitt Romney, Liz Cheney. Those are all very nice people, but boy, our politics are very different. Well, well but hold, but hold on. Do you not yeah. acknowledge that those people are considered to be in that same normal lane that you're trying to claim for yourself? No. You think no, th very you different. think that they're to the left of you? No, no. no. Well, okay. Let's take them one. But Liz Cheney is actually one of the most conservative. Politi if you look at her voting record, her, she's her Trump immensely score was conservative. Ni Ninety-three conservative. percent with Trump was yeah. her Trump score. Yeah, right. So yeah. she's very conservative, very socially conservative. I'm not. Uh, I'm more considered socially moderate. Much more socially. She was just anti-Trump. Right. Larry Hogan is a, a great friend of mine, but massively anti-Trump. He would come out, and, and Charlie Baker would do this too. These are great friends of mine, and I think they were great governors for their states. Larry in, being in Maryland, Charlie being in Massachusetts, understanding their political dynamics of very left-wing states. So. The thing that was frustrating, though, Trump would say or something inappropriate or whatever it was, 2017, 2018, 2019, and these guys would be, my friends, would be the first ones out of the gate just to tear them apart. And then, of course, the problem was the press would then turn right to me and say, well, what do you think what Larry said? What do you think what Charlie said? And I'm like, look, those guys are really anti-Trump. They are never Trumpers. I'm not. I supported them in 16. I support them in 20. Right? I'm a Republican. And I'm going to support the Republican nominee. Those folks have all been pretty clear that they wouldn't necessarily support the Republican nominee. So I, that's, not, that's just a, a very different thing. Well, They're more the, anti-never yeah. Trumpers. I'm not. Yeah. I'm just, I just think that America and the party is going to do the right thing and move on. Th this is the point I was going to make. Yeah. That Hogan, after he announced last week that he's not going to run, said, I will not support Trump. Yeah, and you've I, said, mm. I will support the nominee. Yeah. What if you're wrong? And he is the nominee. Oh, no. You'll support him. I'll, I'll support the nominee. Absolutely. You will. It's better than the left-wing socialism that's tearing this country apart. And we can't, you can't deny what's happening in D.C. You, look, inflation is the worst tax on the poor you could ever possibly imagine. And it is tearing people apart. It is making it completely unaffordable. You're going to tell me even on social policies the Democrats know what they're doing? You walk the streets of San Francisco... And you tell me that there's humanity in that city. It is disgusting. I lived there for three years. I went back there to where I lived. It, it, it literally almost brings me to tears. You're going to tell me Gavin Newsom, his policies are better for low-income, poor families that are struggling to make ends meet? It's a tragedy. It is a mental health tragedy. Is it a drug tragedy? And it is a homelessness tragedy. And they don't want to touch it. They don't want to look at it because it would be racist, inappropriate, too woke, too anti-woke to actually get your hands dirty and, and take that issue on. I, take, I have the lowest poverty rate in the country. It's not easy. I work really, really hard at it. I think some of these other states that claim to be socially responsible, especially these left-wing liberal states, should look at themselves in the mirror, have to look at themselves, be accountable to it, because I think the conservative message is the right message in terms of bringing families up. I mean, you had, you had Bernie Sanders on the other night that couldn't even tell you the difference between equity and equality. The, that's his brand, and he couldn't even tell you the difference between those two, two, two. If you cannot tell me the difference between equity and equality, I never want to hear the word woke come out of your mouth because you don't know what you're talking about. And I get held accountable every day to this stuff. And so, yes, I get really frustrated, really frustrated with my peers that that are bringing this tragedy to our country, a country with immense opportunity, complete should have complete economic and energy security, but we're letting this nonsense get in our way of our own successes. So yes, I will absolutely take a Republican over the crazy that we have in Washington today. Let me, uh, let me ask you about Governor DeSantis, who you know in a different way that you know the former president because you serve together among the Republican governors. He leads a state that, at least if you listen to him, is the most conservative state in the country as he's said in his inaugural, this is where woke goes to die.
right? Like he's embracing that as his brand. Yeah. What well, do you think yeah. about him? <laughs> What do you think about that guy? So uh, Ron's a good guy, a good guy, a good governor. Um, we have very different philosophies. Um, it's definitely not, con uh, there's, there's I'd, I'd say, um, uh, some holes in that argument of conservatism. Uh, I'm a free market guy. I think that's at the heart, at the heart of being a conservative is the idea that you know better than me. A business can do what you want. Live free or die, right? In New Hampshire, that's our motto, but it's more than four words on the license plate. It is really about Limited government, local control, you do you. You have a, you, and we're gonna use the obvious example of Disney, right? Disney's incredibly woke, I think it's a huge mistake, and it isn't the government that's gonna fix that, or should fix that, or should care about that, it's the free market. So you wouldn't have touched Disney of the, course way that, not. the way that the state of Florida. Of course not, it, would bring, it brings a whole chilling effect to businesses across the country, because you know what? When Stacey Abrams and the left wing political machine put pressure on Major League Baseball to take the All-Star game out of Georgia, I was furious about that too. Why should politics come into the into play of business? If, if Major League Baseball wants to make that choice on their own, God bless it, that's their choice, it would, would have been a wrong choice. But they were pressured politically. No one should ever be pressured politically based on their, uh, you know, their business shouldn't be, their business decisions should not be pressured politically. That is anti-American. It is very un-American, and I'm very passionate about that. Do I agree with it? No. Let me look, at, 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 in New Hampshire, uh, we talk about schools a lot. Most all the school decisions are made town by town. Every school contract, the parents say what the contract should be. The parents say what the curriculum should be. You know, Glenn, uh, Glenn Youngkin is a great friend. I think he's a phenomenal governor, and, and maybe even a, a great president someday. That would be great. And he said, parents matter. And what he was really saying is, you as an individual matter. And I said, Glenn, finally. Somebody from one of the other 49 states is saying what New Hampshire has been doing for 200 years. That is the core of us because individuals always come first before government. And so in doing that, do I, do I agree with every decision that every school board in New Hampshire makes? No. But should I go correct them as the, gov as the conservative governor? No, because I wouldn't want a liberal governor correcting a conservative town. If, if you're not doing it right, like if a school board is doing something against the, the desires of the parents, then the parents will show up at town meeting and fire them all. That's the power that we have because they have the power, not big government. And so this idea that you have some Republicans, and, and look, Ron's the latest example of many. He's not the only one. I see Republicans trying to outdo Democrats at their own game of big government solutions. That, that is not who we are. That is not conservative at our core. So we need, and, and the other issue I take a little bit, and I've told Ron this, I said, smile. <laughs> Please smile a little more, Ron. You're always yelling at somebody, right? You know, and I get it, it gets the base fired up. But if you're always yelling at somebody, you're, you're not looking like you're enjoying it, two things happen. Number one, you're not inspiring folks to get on your team. No one gets inspired by, by, by getting yelled at, right? Um, you're also, if somebody doesn't look like they enjoy their job, do you, do you believe they're giving 120%? And, and, and as a leader, I, I want people to know I love what I do, I'm willing to take the challenges, I'm willing to take any hard question, um, and I'm gonna give you 120%. Maybe we agree, maybe we don't. And I'm gonna be crazy transparent about everything we do. Transparency is the foundation of public trust and that's, what, that's why nobody believes in Washington on either side of the aisle. They're, they're in this bubble, they're not very transparent. They sometimes come out and pass something, they don't even read their own bills. There's no connectivity to us down here. But we're not down here. The, the, the founding fathers had it right, the states, they come first, we come first, we created Washington, but they've manipulated that, that. and even Republicans have kind of lost some of the focus of that. You guys, t Texas needs to come first, Austin needs to even come ahead of Texas, right? That's the way it works, there are cities and towns that come before the state, as it should, because there's more accountability, more efficiency of government, that's how you balance budgets, that's how you maintain control, and they empower people to really be a part, not just a vote, but a 24-7 empowering, empowering part of their process. I, I was going to wait to talk about this later, but I want to talk about it because you've just teed it up now, this idea of local control, which you, very specifically, when you were inaugurated this last time, after being elected to your fourth term, you specifically called out local control as a conservative principle. Oh, yeah. Here in Texas, we seem to have forgotten the old Jeffersonian idea that the best government is closest to those being governed. That's right. We've gone from local control to control the locals. Yeah. Right, where the state doesn't like what the cities and the counties do, they come in and they swoop in. Austin's a great example. You said Austin ought to have control more than the state over its own future. 
Our own governor would disagree with you about that. He's made Austin a punching bag every two years in our legislature. Yeah. Well, look, I can do so. I, I have cities that I might disagree with, and I'll publicly disagree with them. But I'm not going to use my power as I don't know what's happening here per se. But in New Hampshire, I don't use my power to punish, penalize, take more control over those cities that just because they disagree. You know why? Because the free market will take care of it. People will make a choice. They'll say, "Look, either we like living in Austin," uh, and again, I, I, I'm. I'm just visiting here. I don't know the real story, but I do hear this whole defunding of the police and all that. I don't know what the real story is. You guys will know that a lot better than I do. But if that's having a, neg a chilling effect, if the left-wing woke principles of the city are hurting businesses, people are going to get up and move their business, and they're going to go to another city. And so the, that is the free market adjusting to the politics. And if the politics are working and they're pro-business and they're pro-individual and you so support police and law enforcement, people feel safe and secure in their communities, they have more say in their schools, more people are gonna come in. Let the market work. That's the foundation of, of the American principle. And it has worked really well. I think just lately we're, we're getting, we're, as, a, as, as Republicans, I get nervous we're losing our brand, man. You know, we're, 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 we're forgetting what we're really about because there's a lot of money in DC there's a lot of money to be made, not personal money per se, but like, you know, money to raise for your campaigns and your PACs and all of that to have more influence. There's a lot to be, to be made when you're having the fight. I mean, that's what the Kevin McCarthy thing was about. Kevin McCarthy, the reason they didn't vote for him 14 times is because they, every time they didn't vote for him, they'd all send out an email blast and they would make money. And eventually that started trickling down and they said, okay, I guess we're done making money. We'll let him be speaker now. I mean, that's effectively what happened. So there's a lot of money, unfortunately, to be made in the fight of things. That's just the nature of it. But I th still think that competency and account accountability within government and allowing locals to make their own good and bad decisions. It's like your kids, right? If I made every decision for my kid and told them what was the right thing to do and didn't let them fall down and didn't let them learn from their failures, right? They, they wouldn't be strong individuals as they grow up. Well, you got to treat cities and towns. They got to go through their pains and they got to figure out what their constituents really want. San Francisco is another good example. I'm passionate about San Francisco because I used to live there for a few years. When their school board got really out of control and ultra woke, even in San Francisco, they turned against their school board and said enough is enough and started firing those people, right? That was the free market working. It wasn't because this, um, Gavin Newsom said, or President Trump at the time said, or whatever. It was really the folks of that city saying, enough is enough. We love this city too much. These policies aren't working. We need to change. That is at the yeah. heart of the American spirit. So in the spirit of this conversation being about the future of conservatism, we've talked about local control as yeah. one element of conservatism. Another one I want to talk about is liberty. We hear so much about liberty, liberty, liberty. But it actually reads like liberty unless I disagree with you. Yeah. <laughs> right? Everyone should be free unless they want to get an abortion. Everyone should be free unless they want to marry the person of their choice or play the sport they want to play based on their gender identity. You have actually taken a different position from a lot of Republicans in your time in politics. You uh, view yourself as a pro-choice Republican, do you not? Yeah. 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 You, you would not uh, permit a policy in New Hampshire, as I understand it, that would have required a school to out a student based on sexual orientation to the parents of that student, correct? Yeah, so you're trying to like the parental rights stuff. Yes, yeah. I mean, you, you, so you, have, you have played a very different game yeah, as it relates I, to culture war stuff. Yeah, so could I, I, I want to clarify. I like parental bill of rights, but to the, when it, it gets, some of them go way too far. Right. Wait, where you're going to force a teacher to call a parent to say, by the way, do you know your kid is gay? Like, no, 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 no. what are we doing here, guys? Right. If there are, are health and safety issues around that child, then absolutely there has to be communication with the, with the parent and the teacher because the safety of the, that child has to come first. Right. I think we can all agree on the that. The point is you seem unconflicted about what liberty means. That's my point. Oh, I'm completely unconflicted. Look, yeah. live for your die. You do you. It, I'm, I'm the governor, and I'm not here how to tell you how to live your life. Right? We're going to put guidelines and things in to make sure people are safe, you know, especially around kids, right, in terms of safety measures and all of that sort of thing. But... Look, when it comes to, let's go back to the school thing. I, I believe very strongly in the concept of one trusted adult. I believe, and I don't believe, I know the real crisis of America is the still trying to figure out the mental health crisis, especially around kids. 
that is the real crisis in America because it leads to the drug crisis. It leads to homelessness issues. It leads to disenfranchise. It leads to all of these other things that happen. And we're just barely trying to scratch the surface. Uh oh, what do we do? And sometimes just that one trusted adult, a coach, a teacher, whatever it is, somebody that kid wants to talk to can be the lifesaver. You put a chilling effect on that. You tell, start telling teachers, um, with your, if a kid starts telling you about, you know, import, you know, deep issues, you got to write it all down and you better tell the parent. And if you don't, we're going to put you in jail. Like all that. That's nonsense. That is crazy. So you got to have that, allow that communication to happen. Now, if there are things that come out of that conversation where that child might be in harm, harm to themselves, harm to whatever, of course, that's a, that's a line that's crossed and there's a process for that. Um, but you got to make sure that we're addressing this stuff. What the, I think America's crisis is at its core issue is I don't know anybody who in their right. own family or someone else isn't dealing with uh, drug abuse, mental health, um, uh, you know, basically um, self-medicating with drugs or whatever it might be. You can go pull the, the homeless population right now. Right now, the numbers are somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the homeless population is dealing with some form of mental health issue. So the issue isn't so much we don't have enough housing, that's a, that is an issue of course, but it's also how do you provide the services? Do we have the staff to provide the services? Uh, how, when can we force somebody to take services? There are so many individuals that are dealing with mental health issues, they're homeless, I've gone to them and they're like, no, we don't, we, I, I, I don't want service. I don't want your housing, I don't want your services, I'm fine where I am. So where's the role of government in then forcing that issue to come, right? If they're not a harm to themselves or others, then you know, it's, it's hard to say we're gonna put you in handcuffs and bring you in and we're gonna force you to take your meds. Well, that's, that's yeah. crossing a line, obviously. So those are the, the issues of the system that we really have to address. But when you do that, when you, you can get amazing results. And it's why we have such a low homeless population and l such a low poverty rate and all that sort of thing in New Hampshire. When, when you talk about, le I, I'm interested in this conversation about education and the idea that it ought to be the school districts that make decisions. It should not come from the top. All over the country, including Texas, we're hearing we want to tell schools what they can do on the teaching of history, DEI-related sure. stuff, right? Um, it would logically extend from what you said that you also believe schools should be able to make those decisions themselves and that if the parents in that community don't like it, the accountability is the parents speak up and they say we got to change this. Yeah, so here's the line. Yeah. Let's talk, the, 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 the key word of the day is critical race theory, right? Um, we can you tell me what that is, please? No, nobody can. That's, right. that's the problem. It, it's right. this amorphous thing that keeps changing its definition. Right. And, and I, I see bills out there that, and pe folks came in to me and said, we need to pass a, a banned critical race theory. I said, guys, we had this discussion with my legislature. I said, you can't even tell me what that is. I have a sense of what it is. I don't like that it's being preached in schools. I get that. I'm with you on that. But if you just say we're banning critical race theory, hold on. You're not, you got to get into the next level of detail. Should we talk about communism and what socialism is and democracy and freedom and slavery and what critical race theory is, if we can find a dip? We should be able to have those discussions about all of those things in the classroom. Now, when a teacher starts telling students that because they're white and they have white privilege and they're less than other students, now you've discriminated. And that, that's an easy one. So I passed a law that was very simple. I said, a teacher will not discriminate against kids in the classroom based on col you know, the color of their skin, their economic input, their sexual identity or gender, whatever it is. I passed something that we can all agree on. But that does mean you cannot tell the white kids that they somehow owe something to somebody and they're lesser. You can't tell an Arab American kid that he has a propensity for terrorism. You can't tell a, an African American kid that he's a propensity for crime. Those are all horrible discriminatory things. And the fact that you do have teachers, by the way, that have gone that far in classroom is concerning. That's real. So I passed a law very simply that says, I'm not gonna define critical race theory. I'm not gonna define whatever the next thing is. I'm gonna make sure we all can live by a standard of, of equality and giving everybody that opportunity and not taking somebody's opportunity from them because of the color of their skin. And we see that all happening all over the country right now. It's wrong. And so that's, I think, I think we passed the best law in the country because it's that simple. You have states that have that tried to pass anti critical race theory laws that are gonna get fought and, and maybe even defeated in court because your point, Evan, they can't be defined. So yeah. let's keep it basic, right? Let's talk about what these things are so kids know, they're aware, but let's not preach to them and let's not right. advocate one way or the other around it. Um, one other point that I've heard you make before is that you know, this is, should be a big tent party. There should be room for everybody yeah. 
in the Republican Party. But there is this absolute, you have to agree with us all the time or we're going to find you a primary opponent thing. We're going to do retribution against you. I recall when um, uh, you had Republicans who were for the infrastructure bill in Congress because they thought it was going to be good for their district. There were calls for retribution against those people. You spoke out against that. Later today on this stage, we have Congressman Tony Gonzalez from South Texas. I like Tony. Good guy. Who, you know, has cast votes as he felt for his district mm -hmm. that differed with his party on guns, differed with his party on same-sex marriage, you know, has kind of take, gone his own ways. Independent-minded guy, but a conservative. Texas GOP last week, or I think it was the state Republican executive committee, censured him. So yeah. you, you don't you don't think this ought to be no. the party's approach to expanding the tent of conservatism? You know what the best part of my job is? I get to be, and my job is to be really selfish. Selfish for the 1.4 million people I represent. My job is to put them first every single time. I want 49 other states and all these different metrics saying, how does New Hampshire do it? And and it's great, and that's my job. T Tony's job is to put his district first, and if it's his in, it's his in, in his district's interest to fight hard for a bill, and he believes that, and he's been elected to do that, then he should fight for that. You don't censure someone because they're doing their job. You might, they might disagree vehemently on it. Maybe it doesn't align exactly with your overall party national platform, but your job is to fight for your districts. That's why we have a Congress. So no, obviously, my, that, my way in saying that, that's crazy, right? right. I don't blame, um, I was gonna use Gavin as an example, but I, I blame Gavin for everything, but I'm just kidding. I, you, you, I don't blame Gavin Newsom for being as left-wing kooky as he is with that stuff, because guess what? Apparently his state likes it, right? And if you don't, you're, they're getting up with their feet, and there's a mass exodus out of California. They move, they're moving they are, here, in right? Fact, right? And yeah. people will move with their feet, and the right. market will adjust. And guess what? They got more Republicans in Congress in California this year, right? So I don't blame someone for doing their job, but I just know that right. when the system works the way it should, right. there will be accountability to that. C can you explain to me, because you seem to be smart about politics, how a pro-choice Republican who doesn't want to vote to ban critical race theory, believes in local control, and doesn't want to bust other Republicans for not being 100% with them gets through a Republican primary. How do you get through a Republican primary for president believing the things that you just said you Are you were? telling me I'm not charming? I, come on, are you telling well, me I'm just selling? You're, you're very charming, but in a Republican primary, yeah. charming and 75 cents gets you a Coke. I mean, you know that. So look, uh, let, you gotta t so look at, you gotta look at all the issues. So someone says, well, you could never do well in Iowa. Do you know in Iowa, only about 15, 16% of the electorate actually go to the caucuses? Yes. And it's all the very conservative evangelical crowd, right? Which is fine. And all the candidates f year after year after year go fight for that, that crowd. Young people are never even invited. Young Republicans, more independent-minded Republicans, the other 85% of the party is never actually even really invited to participate in the caucus. That's my 85. And I wouldn't sit and fight over this. I'm gonna go after the folks that agree with me, that would like what we're bringing to the table, that agree with, but are just never invited to the conversation. And you think they're not turning out to caucus because no one is talking about that's issues right. like you are. That's your, that's your theory of the case. No one talks to them or right. about their issues. Look, one of my biggest fears is that Republicans right now are missing a huge uh, factor, which is young people, and I'll say 32 and under, that are Republicans, that even identify as Republicans today, have very different priorities, not different conservative values, but different priorities in terms, they believe the environment's important. They're not climate change crazy, right? This Green New Deal garbage, but they do wanna know that the government's gonna take smart, responsible measures to transition into fossil, uh, away from fossil fuels, uh, not put uh, high energy burdens on, on individuals, but appreciate that we all want a cleaner environment. And they just want somebody that acknowledges, I, I'm a former environmental engineer, I, I do that very, very well. They wanna know that you're, you're doing something about homelessness. That's a big priority for young Republicans, not just young voters, but young Republicans. And so we, we're, we're still talking about the priorities of the 50 and up Republicans, because yeah. they tend to vote more. But man, as concerned as I'm, I am about 2024 for Republicans, I'm scared to death of 2028 2032, 2036, because generationally, we are losing them on messaging. And so I'm, I'm simply trying to be a bridge. I'm right. just trying to like remind them the really good things that Republicans can bring, the aspirational, inspirational tone that we can bring to things and make sure that they know they are more important than us. I am governor, but by God, this is not about me. The job is so much bigger than me. And to have that sense of 
I'm really proud of the extraordinary things I've gotten done for my state. And I walk with a lot of confidence, but I also walk with a huge sense of gratitude and humility because it ain't about me, right? And I think just as a, as not just as Republicans, but as Americans, we all have to wake up with a little more sense of gratitude here, people. This country is amazing. It's a gift to wake up in this country every day. I was, we, I did a, I was in a, a discussion just like this. I was in the crowd just like you were talking with President Zelensky two days ago. It, 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 it's, it's unbelievable. And you, you think what those folks are going through, you right. want to help and all that. But boy, you also walk out with a sense of, thank God I'm in a, in a, I'm, I, I get to be in this country and I'm so blessed to be there. So I just think with that type of attitude, you can bring, make the party bigger, get that next generation on board, reinvigorate the electorate in the right way. We're, n we're not all angry activists, but we're just empowered individuals making more decisions for ourselves. So, That's so Republican to me. I, I'm glad you brought up Ukraine because I want to ask you about two more things on which you and your party may not be entirely aligned because you are, you know, you're speaking truth today, right? Your own truth. So let's talk about this. So on, on, the, on Ukraine, we have a, a, a component of the Republican Party that wants us to give up military and financial aid to Ukraine. Huge mistake. You've got to win. There's, no, there's right. no middle ground here. You win in Ukraine, period, end of story. And right. anyone who says that we shouldn't be doing everything we can to win there is not fighting for America's security, America's self-interest. And I'm America first. I got no problem saying America first. And the American first attitude says you beat Putin. He's evil. And what's going to happen to every coalition? Every coalition that depends on us when they want us to defend Taiwan or they want our help in something else. Yep. They're going to say, well, America's behind us today. Who knows what they'll do tomorrow, right? So you've got to end that and take the advantage that you have. The Ukrainian people have given their lives and everything in beating one of our biggest enemies. The least we should be doing is supporting, winning that thing, and really, you send a message to China, you send a message to North Korea, to Iran, to all of our coalition partners, to all of our allies, and it's the right message, but it only happens if and when you win, yeah. and so there's just, there's not even a gray area there. The, uh, the pushback against that, I suppose, would be, would be this. So Nikki Haley, who is now in the race for president, was in Iowa this last week, and she came out before a crowd and said, I support the U.S., confronting Putin yeah. and a guy stood up in the audience and said Ukraine is not an ally I'm done with the Republican Party if it's going to be a war party yeah, so you, the pushback no, you, is the Republicans by supporting Ukraine are actually supporting the idea that they're a war party yeah that, that's that's just that's insanity that that's you know too many people watching Tucker Carlson or all this nonsense you know this opinionated news uh, and that that is just wrong they're absolutely wrong it is in America's interest you know the and, and you can we can break it down to its minimal level and say the enemy of my enemy is is you know my friend if you really wanted to take it to that level but there is no no doubt when when if and when we win this thing we've created an ally a very important ally with ukraine we've created allies in western europe uh yeah eastern europe which are very important with uh, latvia and all the other countries that are there that know we're going to stick by them if and when uh, folks step up and, and cross the line. And it is in our direct interest to win that thing. And so I, I just, I, any other arguments nonsense. It's just, just rookie, bunch of rookies. So, so the other thing I want to ask you about is January 6th. Um, you have been explicit in your feelings about January 6th. What you, year are we talking about? We're talking about January 6th of 2021. Oh, per that one, perhaps, yeah. perhaps you heard of it. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. You, you specifically said at the time and after these were riots the participants were domestic terrorists they have to be held accountable that's not changed your point of view on that is no different no right but you know <laughs> that there's a conversation that in part has been catalyzed by speaker mccarthy giving the footage to tucker carlson this week all of a sudden these are actually sightseers the former president is talking about how we ought to release these political prisoners who were responsible for january 6th i will note that while the gridiron is still a comedy show vice president pence last night yeah. in a very unfunny part of his speech, said specifically, history will hold Donald Trump accountable for January 6th. He kind of came at Donald Trump last night to the degree that Mike Pence ever does with both barrels on that issue. Well, look, Mike, Mike Pence is the hero of January 6th. I mean, the, the pressure that he had to, I mean, put yourself in his shoes for two seconds. Not only was it pressure from his, his partner, the president, someone he had been loyal to for four years, the pressure of thousands of people outside that literally want right. to hang him, right? and still said, I am not going to waver. God bless it, right? Can you imagine if he had? And can any of us say that we absolutely would have made that say? I mean, we all want to think that we would have, but the pressure there, and, and, and he deserves all the credit in the world for that. 
So no, I mean, he was there. He, he read it. Now, uh, Nancy Pelosi was there. I don't know if she talked about it this morning, but she was there, and, and we saw the video coverage there. Look, I, I, it, 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 the, the six is what it is. I don't, I, I, I'm looking at the crowd. I don't think any of us disagree about what happened there. It's clear. Nothing has changed. Um, is it going to be a factor in the primary? I, I, guess I could that's selectively my find you video of the Russians invading Ukraine where they're just walking down the road having conversations, and it looks like they're just wandering in. Yeah, Sightseers. No, no big deal. Right, Sightseers, yeah. right? No big deal. Come on. It, that's, that's, that's crazy. That's really crazy. Now, the rest of the media is getting all, from my understanding, is going to get all that video footage as well. And my, this is my problem with January 6th, and this is where the Democrats have screwed up. So we said that we we're going to have these hearings. And a lot of us said, good, have the hearings. Let's find out and let's make sure the hearings if we can figure out, A, what happened, but where the vulnerabilities in the Capitol are, how we keep people safe, how we make sure it doesn't happen again, all of that. Two and a half years later, are we anywhere closer to knowing any of that? Can you tell me that this, the, the Capitol is safer today and how, what they discovered and what? No. So they, the Democrats screwed it up. They made it, and they had the opportunity to do right by it. America would have galvanized around that uh, transparency, independence, and decisions that came from it, and they made it overly political. Raskin and these guys made it very political. And so even folks that, like myself that want, were dying to see what they came out with are still going, well, this just turned into political nonsense. At you, the you, end. So you they missed a huge yeah. opportunity, and they still need to do it right, by the way. You think the hearings were overly political even though yes. everybody who testified was Republican? I mean, the people who testified before the 1 6 committee almost expressly were Republicans. Why, did, why should that matter? Well, because I'm why just wondering. Why should that matter? What, it was about was security of the. Uh, can you tell me? Yeah. All right, let's just go to the result. I'm a okay. results guy. Okay. Can you tell me what they have done and why to secure the Capitol to make sure that, for just from a security standpoint, that that's not going to happen again? Well, I know one of the things that happened no. during the hearings was that a number of members of Congress were subpoenaed, asked to testify to talk about what roles they may have played in aiding the people who stormed sure. the Capitol, and they refused to testify. Well, I get it, but but isn't the re don't we just want to make sure the whole system is safer and it doesn't happen? But I can't tell you that. Right. Nobody can tell us that. So I just want the answer to that. Don't we all want that? So let's get there. You can talk about the political pros and cons and who is responsible. That's important to figure out, too. But at its essence and core, we got to make sure this doesn't happen again, guys. And the, they failed. They absolutely failed in, in that measure. And, and it got political. And look, Liz Cheney would do her testimony, would do her thing, and she'd send out three fundraising emails that same day. Come on. Come on. You can't tell me that wasn't overly politicized. So they, they blew a huge opportunity. I don't... I, I think we all know who is to blame. I think there was a lot of people that maybe haven't been blamed that should be blamed. We got to get to the heart of that. But politics got in the way and they messed it up. So, yeah, I'm frustrated because I was with them to say, let's have those hearings. I'm really ticked off that I still have no idea. Two years later, I've, wh by the way, why wasn't, fo why wasn't all the footage released? I mean, isn't that, why are we even talking about new footage? Well, shouldn't that have all been transparently released back in tw late 21? So we could have had the hearings and, and figured it all out in 22. But what's going on here? So wh what, you, what I think folks fail to realize is a lot of independents, moderate Republicans, conservative Democrats that, are, that like myself, go, yeah, what the hell was that? They didn't do it right. So we have about eight minutes left. I want to talk about President Biden for the balance of that time, because whether or not you run in the next election, you will have a point of view about what this administration did and did not do. I'm not very opinionated either. No, not at all. It's, you're shy and retiring. It's hard to get you to actually tell us what you think. So you talked about inflation. Yes. I saw the jobs numbers on Friday. I've seen the unemployment numbers in this country over the last couple of months. Yeah. You know, there is a case to be made standing back from this stuff. Economy looks pretty good, mm -hmm. right? Um, American Rescue Plan was signed into law. Uh, two years ago yesterday, both the American Rescue Plan and the infrastructure bill both provided lots of money to states like yours. Too much. You yeah. think too much? Of course. Did you oppose those bills? Uh, going back on it, there was just a lot of fluff in there. I don't think you needed both of them. Yeah. You, look, I mean, things are too expensive. I, I'm okay, but low-income families are not. They can't pay their electric bill, guys. They can't pay their rent. So, yeah, that inflation is, it has a real mathematical consequence, and it's a, a horrible tax on the poor that you can't just undo. It takes years. You had a Secretary of Treasury telling you that the inflation will be temporary. Never in the history of the world has inflation been temporary. And she's the Secretary of the Treasury just feeding us a bunch of BS. 
So I get very frustrated with that. I, I take pride in my understanding of macroeconomics and what an inverted And so there's a campaign to be waged by you or somebody else against what may seem to a civilian to be a pretty good economy. Yeah, so, well, le so let's talk about that. I think where Republicans are screwing up, and I've heard other presidents, you know, pres I'm not, I say other, I'm not a presidential candidate, but I've heard presidential candidates. You almost did it, didn't did you? It. You close? almost did it. But God, others, I thought we had I've you. I've heard others on the stage go, this econ you know, Americans are, are getting crushed by this economy. You got to be careful with that. Right now, Americans have more debt than ever before. That is real. And that's only going to get worse. There's no question. But you can't walk down most streets in America and say this, you know, people are struggling, right? That, that's, don't, and I tell, I tell my peers, all don't lead with that because it, it, it's hard to take anything else you say seriously because for the most part, people are getting by, right? So what you can talk about is the real dynamics of credit card debt, of unaffordable housing, but you can't say that America's economy is getting crushed because we have very high wages to compensate for very high inflation. Now, all that comes to bear, not this year, but in the coming years. People don't realize governments are still holding a lot of the cash, right? They allocated all this money. We haven't even spent half of it yet. So inflation is going to remain high. In, in New Hampshire, time. literally, you have not spent about half of the money. I've allocated, I'll say, 80% of my ARPA funds. That's a rough number. The actual checks that have gone out the door, because some of this stuff is you know, still getting underway, the applications for the programs, uh, maybe 60%, 70%. But that means right. there's hundreds of millions of dollars in little old New Hampshire that still has yet to even go out the door that's going to keep things, and primarily around construction jobs, things like that. Right. The real tragedy of America's economy right now is a lack of young people re-entering the workforce. So from uh, the 18 to 32-year-olds are still significantly down in workforce participation. The older, the, the 35 and ups, are back to where they were pre-pandemic. Why? Why is that? I'm, I, I, do you know why? Uh, I, go ahead. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Go ahead. Because the federal government is not letting young people feel their debt. They've deferred student loans for years. They've given them free rent, these free rent programs for years. Young people aren't feeling the pains, the struggles of, oh, crap, I better get out there and, and, and get my job and do my hours because I got debts. I got bills to pay. They're not feeling it, but that is going to come to bear. Right. And, and even if Biden get, got away with his $10,000 student loan stuff, which is a bunch of nonsense and should never happen, again, you, you have debt, people have to pay it. Older people, the older generation, are going out there and re-entering the workforce. Now, the tragedy of that is I need social workers, I need mental health workers, I need nurses, I need that young, skilled workforce to re-engage. I have all the money in the world. Money is not the problem. Programs are not going without money. We're going without staff. So there's so many dollars not even being utilized because young people are not re-entering the workforce, primarily because they're not, f on the majority of them, are not feeling the pains of debt, which the federal government is at least temporarily trying to absolve them for, for political reasons. But it breaks up the whole economic dynamic of our American system. So this is a question I suspect you have an answer to, but I want to hear exactly what it is. President just put a budget in front of Congress. Any president's budget is DOA. It's not going to be relevant, but it does frame a discussion about what the priorities yeah. ought to be. Yeah. $6.8 trillion budget, of which $5 trillion in proposed tax increases on high earners and corporations over a decade offsets hmm. the new spending. Why shouldn't the rich governor pay their fair share, as the, as the president defines it? Well, right now, the rich pay a lot of most of the taxes, right? So right now, the rich pay the, a, 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 you know, the vast majority. I don't know exactly what the, what but the numbers you are. But you fear but the amount, you believe yeah. that the percentage, the amount that the rich pay is sufficient. I think you can balance the budget without having to, to drastically raise taxes over and above of, of where he's going. Okay. Now, to his credit, he's putting out a budget. He's saying, I move, now you go. And so now Republicans better put something up. One of the main reasons I didn't run for the U.S. Senate is because I don't think Republicans, again, we've talked about this, I don't think Republicans in Washington you know, have the strength to be as fiscally conservative as they should be. I've always cut taxes in my state. I've always come, come back with more revenue than I ever thought possible. Why? Because ever, all the businesses want to come to New Hampshire. So I cut taxes, I get rid of regulation, businesses flood into New Hampshire, we have a small business tax, I have no income tax. I have no sales tax. I have no interest in dividends tax, or at least I got rid of that. I have no millionaire's tax or death. I don't have any of that. But businesses are plying in, and the little bit of business tax we take, we actually have more money than ever before. So what do I do with that money? I don't create more government. I send it to those cities and towns, because they're going to spend it, as we discussed earlier, more efficiently than I could. 
So there are good models of economics that can be done here, same at the federal government, where that wouldn't require massive tax hikes. And the answer is, like, let's use the Department of Education. Right. Okay? Do I need 10,000 employees at the Department of Education in Washington? No. I need about maybe 1,000. So I'm going to drain the swamp, get rid of 9,000 employees. I'm going to send all the money and most of the regulatory control back to Texas. And hopefully they'll send it back to Austin and back to New Hampshire. And then you let the states spend the money much more efficiently than the federal government. Because anything that's one size fits all out of the feds is usually a bad idea. right? Because New Hampshire and Texas are very different. Texas and New Mexico and Oklahoma, you're all very different. So you guys will spend the money way better, way more efficient with your government than the feds could. So let's drain the swamp, decentralize government, go back to federalism as this country was founded on, and you actually can balance budgets that way. You can create much more efficiency and much more empowerment from the locals. All right, so this summer you're going to decide. <laughs> you can write my budget. Because it kind of sounds like you've decided. All right. Um, no, no, I, I, I'm, I think I'm very clear where the Republican Party needs to go. I want young people to be part of our team. I think we got an awesome product. Right. Just because a couple folks on the top of the ticket, on top of the messaging, you know, that, that are kind of the 8 p.m. hour and on on Fox, they don't necessarily drive the best message. But that doesn't define most Republicans. Right. It really doesn't. We're, we're, at the, we're, we're at the end. I got to say, I've pulled all-nighters and not been half as energetic as you were during the last I hour. Look, I love so what I do. Don't you good. love what you do? I love what so I do. So you could pull an all-nighter and go to the paper and crank it out, right? Maybe. I could never do that. Maybe. I'm, not a, I'm a math guy. I, I can't. I'm a terrible writer. Right. Although, uh, although maybe I'll write a book. I thought about writing a book. Yeah, have you guys read these political books, by the way? You've read these things. Give me a break. I, I have read it those It is sleeping books. pills. Yeah. It is ridiculous. I'm going to write a, here it is, copyright 2023, is that Three. what year it is? Three. I'm going to write a book called Never Buy a Book from a Politician by Governor Chris Sununu. Chris, there That's you go. That's going to be Good. the name Good. of my Good. book. Good place to end. Governor Chris Sununu, give him a big hand. Thank you very much.